Hello, welcome to another Tonalist Landscape oil painting demonstration. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy, and the painting I'm bringing you today is um, a study after good old George Ines, and I didn't know the name of his painting when I did the study, which was yesterday, uh, but I did some research and I have located the name and where you can see it in real life and it's called uh, Sunset in Georgia it's at the uh, Milwaukee Art Museum unfortunately they don't have a, a high-res version of it um, th the version that they're putting up uh, it, it looks extremely dark uh, mine is a bit lighter but that's okay because all I gotta do is throw a bit of glaze on it and it's gonna go dark as this is definitely gonna need to have a second pass um, I do have a little bit I'm going to read from an article featuring that painting and um, maybe I'll try and remember to put the link in the um, blog post. I, I will be reading everything pertinent to the painting so you might be able to skip that. Um, uh, unfortunately I kind of was zoomed out here. I guess it's good that you can see how I'm interpreting the uh, Inessa's composition. Uh, one thing is is that when I scaled the um, horizontal dimension to 10 because I wanted to do an 8 by 10 it would have been a seven and a half by 10 um, so what I did was just stretched it a little so it was an 8 by 10 because I have some some nice frames that'll this will look great in also like I said uh, I did lighten it a bit more than the I'd had this little tiny bit of reference for ages I enlarged it in gigapixel uh, which is a program I highly recommend you you invest in if you are trying to upsample things because it it does create some interesting artifacts but it's also it's quite good yeah anyway uh, one of the things I want to talk about with this composition I'm pointing out you know there will be a long version of this it's two hours 20 minutes uh, it would be just this first first session the painting definitely needs a second pass but um, you know, it felt it was in a, a shape that I could uh, present it to you. So there will be a long version, and I'll be talking about this is and that. And, and one of the things I'm going to bring up is um, very interesting how he would center things. So that main group of trees is exactly in the center of the painting, but he has a very clever way of offsetting things. So um, that's a rule that you're not really supposed to do, um, which he breaks all the time, but he breaks it in very clever ways. So you can see the, the next tree on our left is exactly subdividing that space that he created. And uh, one of the things I've been doing lately, and if you've been following the channel, you, you already know about it, is I've been um, uh, dividing the uh, reference into uh, four squares, you know, just dividing it in half and half again. It's the easiest grid you can do. Um, but uh, it definitely has helped me sort out uh, definitely in fact I started doing this on a nest because I'd noticed on several studies I was pushing things in the wrong spot um, I did get a nice soft and essy feeling here and I'm getting better and better at that all the time one of the the big challenges was um, you know this is a completely smooth board so I'm creating textures just with brush strokes and if you compare the way I'm painting here to like some of my uh, and that studies on textured boards you'll see it's a very different approach not not very different it's still me painting but um, uh, you know I have to kind of scumble in and, and create um, patterns and things with the uh, the variance of the brush strokes and values um, this was kind of easier to do in a textured board because you could just kind of drag the brush across the board and get various textures. Um, I mean you still need to to vary your brush strokes on a textured board as well but I think it's a little more work on the smooth um, but I really 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 enjoy working on this smooth masonite and um, by the way just you know if you're new uh, the way I, I prepare the masonite is I, I I uh, get it cut uh, to size by the ply guy. I recommend working with standard frame sizes. That gives you options for ready-made frames um, instead of custom framing, which can be real pricey. And um, uh, but then I sand it uh, once, and then I uh, lay down a coat of uh, transparent gesso. I use Liquin, but I think Golden also has a good one. Um, and this has a little bit of tooth to it, uh, so if I want a very smooth result, I'll sand that down pretty extensively, and then I always put a second coat. 
you, you have to use gesso when you're painting on wood panels otherwise what will happen is over time everything gets absorbed into the wood you need to have a little bit of a buffer there I like the transparent uh, gesso because I really enjoy the I usually work on browns or reds anyway and I just love the color of the masonite you know it just seems it's one of those things that just seems so ordinary like you buy a cheap uh, little plastic frame they have a backing in it that's masonite you know <laughs> it doesn't seem special at all, but that just shows to shows to go, yeah, that uh, anything can be special with the right sort of outlook. Um, let's go ahead and read a little bit of this. Uh, this was from blog.mam.org. That's the uh, that is the um, Milwaukee Art Museum. And uh, I'm thinking of you guys in Milwaukee right now. I know you're having some trouble. Not Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You know. I think it's Kenosha, so they're having some, some problems there, but we're thinking of you, you know, and uh, heck, if you're over in that area, go visit this painting, it looks so cool, um, it doesn't <coughs> actually give me the size of his painting, but um, my guess is that it's like at least 20 by 30, it's a lot more square than a lot of his works, um, uh, it, you know, it's it's not a complete, it's, it's not as square as an 8 by 10 would be, but it's definitely more, it's not a golden mean painting at all. And in the live video, by the way, before I read this, uh, I did, uh, I thought that the his signature read 1880, but it was actually 1890, which is four years before he died. So that does jive a little better with what I was thinking because uh, it looked like real late period stuff to me. It looks like a painting out of the imagination more than anything else. Um, and he had such a level of mastery at that point in his life that... Um, uh, a lot of times he was working off of old sketches and, and he had a, mem a reflexive memory and uh, ability to paint um, this transcendental stuff and this is one of the th one of the things a guy was talking about in his article so oh I'll start from here so um, it says uh, it, it previously he's talking about another painting and how he wasn't very much inspired by um, the works of Thomas Cole and Asher B. Durand and I won't get too much into that, but Asher B. Durand's definitely worth checking. Both of those guys are worth checking out. Asher B. Durand is amazing. Um, but then he goes on to say, uh, it was not only painters that inspired Ines. One of the most influential people Ines looked to was not a painter, but a Swedish scientist and philosopher named Emanuel Swedenborg. Uh, 1688 to 1772. Based on, upon the writings of Swedenborg, Anes began infusing his landscape with references to the idea that there is divinity in nature, and I totally accept this idea myself. Uh, one of the most well-known paintings was, uh, was the theme New Jerusalem. I won't get much into that. Um, you can look into that on your own. Um, the Mew, Mew, Milwaukee Art Museum has uh, this work in its collection by George Ines, Sunset in Georgia, dated 1890. This pacing, painting also has references to the artist's philosophical leanings. It is sli light, lightly, oh, I mean slightly smaller than Autumn by the Autumn by the Sea was the other painting they referenced in the article. Um, shows a small expanse of land. The viewer does not see miles of forest stretching out to the horizon. Instead, we see a small clump of trees. The horizon is lit by the last light of a sunset. There is an orange glow in the distance that casts the landscape into hues of browns, oranges, and reds totally I really th there's a very very minor amount of green in this painting and you'll see me put it at the, at the very end um, I didn't use any other greens although some of the uh, when I was researching this uh, image some of the examples that came up it looked like the trees at the top had more green in them but it's a bit of guesswork when you're dealing with online <sighs> Using light to symbolize divinity. Awesome. This is supported with his use of figure. On the right side, Ines placed an African-American wood gatherer. His vase is bathed in the soft light of the sunset. Since the light represents divinity, Ines is suggesting that this person has accepted or has been blessed by a spiritual presence. It is probably not surprising then to learn that Ines supported the abolitionist movement. Um, funny enough, I just put up a post by uh, Henry Ward um, Beecher uh, with a married to an Ines painting, and I know they were fans of each other, big time friends. 
I believe they were friends. If not, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, in contact with each other on a regular basis. Uh, definitely, I know Ines was not a believer in slavery. He was definitely an abolitionist. With Sunset in Georgia, Ines is showing the importance of African African Americans to the American identity by connecting them to American landscape and as people who embody a divine presence. Now, my painting is too tiny. I did get the figure in there, unlike many of the 5 by 7 studies I've done where I just say, forget the figure. He's in there, um, <laughs> but he's just a couple dots. I, I, yeah, he's not much. But he, he's definitely discernible as a figure, and it was very important, yeah. And I love the way Ines uses figures in the landscape. Um, they're almost never fully uh, rendered... Um, they definitely he has a way of doing them so that they act as compositional elements in the landscape and you can see that he very much balances out the figure in the landscape very much balances out that uh, tree that's subdividing the our left hand uh, side of the uh, painting yeah anyway uh, oh there we not much more here and s died four years after painting sunset in Georgia today he's known as one of the greatest painters in American history. I don't know who's better, but hey. His artworks, which combine the greatness of the painters that surrounded him and his own quest for spiritual meaning, serve as a constant reminder of the beauty of the American landscape. And this was written by Kelsey Rosema, who is a curational intern at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Thank you for that, Kelsey. And uh, I'm a big promoter of Aness. I love his work. Uh, it was uh, a nest that really pushed me into tonalism more than anyone else because um, I, I have actually been interested in various spiritual pursuits pursuits my whole life, and I'm not actively practicing any spiritual path. I think that life itself is a bit of a spiritual path, um, but I know. Um, some things. I know somebody that's going for meaning and imbuing the landscape with meaning when I see it, and I very much try to do that in my own work. Um, and, and by try to do that, I have to say it's not something you can really try to do. You either, um, it's really, uh, and there was, uh, that was that quote, let's say, let's, let's find it. I'm going to read you the quote, because I put it, I put that up on my Facebook today. And the uh, Instagram. I've been making little meme quotes, my my own little um, meme quotes, um, because it's fun and I have the graphics ability to do that. I have some awesome fonts and things. And so the quote from um, Mr. Beecher was, "Every artist dips his brush into his own soul and paints his own nature into his pictures." So it's definitely. Um, a total reflection of who you are. Even me doing a study after a nest, you know, I got it looking pretty good, pretty close, you know. Um, but it still reflects me more than a nest. This is the thing. And um, now, of course, it is a study. It's not going to be as clear and true a reflection, say, as one of my own paintings. But you know, I, I, I don't mind. I mean, I do a lot of my own paintings, and. Uh, um, but I get studies in there, and especially studies after people like Ines, because I feel that his accomplishment was extensive, and I want some of that. And I still have a shot. I've got maybe another, who knows, 20 years of life. Maybe if I'm lucky, 30. Um, if I paint that whole time, I might get, I might get a lot closer than I am uh, to getting trans transcendental uh, meaning into my work you know and that's got to happen through experience and you uh, if you watched my last video you heard me harp on that as I always do but um it's all it's all said with you know love and um and in an effort to pass on what I've learned you know um and I'm always learning and I'm always um modifying uh, what I know and um, or adding to it because once you come across something that's true it's pretty much always going to be true but anyway stay tuned this painting will be going through a glazing session that's really going to look awesome and it looks pretty good right now good enough to share and uh, you know what hey thanks for joining me today and uh, thanks for getting this far along in the video if you haven't already liked the video follow me on Facebook go to my webpage 
buy a painting send me a donation buy me a cup of coffee all that good stuff and I really appreciate you until I come back with another video do me a favor do me a solid take good care of yourself and your family all your loved ones try and love your enemies try and be patient with people especially in this political season and uh, stay out of trouble